What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode here on the Architect Network podcast. Today, we're going to be jumping back into the topic of AI, and we're going to be doing that with the one and only Tim Fu. If you've not come across Tim uh, yet, uh, he is, I guess you could call him an emerging AI architect. Uh, he's been experimenting with tools such as Midjourney and DALI over the last couple of years and really integrating it into his own architectural design process with his own works, as well as of that in where he works at Zaha Hadid. So he's also a designer at Zaha Hadid Architects, working in their Zaha code division as well. And Tim has kind of been sharing his work through social media. He's also experienced this amazing growth on social media, which we'll jump into. And we're going to have a chat with him about how he's actually integrating these tools into his own design process. Like, what is the actual way that we as architects can integrate this? Can we link this with our tools like Rhino and Grasshopper at the moment? Um, so we'll jump into that both in his own personal work and also that in Zaha. We'll also talk a little bit about how this is going to affect our industry, of course, right? At this point, there's no question that AI is going to massively disrupt what we do it's really a question of where are we going to see the most disruption and when and how we'll also jump into his growth on social media and also some of the upcoming thing that he's doing in the world of teaching so tim's been teaching a lot with uh, pa academy for example so you can go and sign up to his courses and actually learn about tools like midjourney and how you can uh, integrate that into your own design process as always, if you like this podcast, please give us a like and a subscribe and share this with your friends and colleagues. It's the whole point of doing this is to spread knowledge around architecture and technology. You can check us out on our Instagram page or our website where you can see upcoming podcasts, courses and events that we're hosting. We are going to be releasing our Rhino Inside course, so stay tuned for that. And we will also shortly be announcing our next episode of Petra Kucha in the pub. So if you're in London, you can come to the event. It's going to be on the 28th of June and the theme will be AI architecture. So we're going to have uh, Tim as well as Will Gardner. He was on an earlier episode in the podcast, as well as many other great guests to talk about AI architecture. So if you're in, if you're in London, come and join us and stay tuned for more details on that to follow. Otherwise, let's get started and jump into a chat with Tim. All right, that's it. We are live. Tim, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me, Ollie. It's a pleasure. Awesome. So um, I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but I'd like to do this kind of a bullet point introduction whilst you're here so you can uh, correct me or add anything to it. But uh, for the audience that may not know you at this point, which I'll be as, I'm sure would be a surprise if they haven't. Uh, so you are a architect. You specialize in parametric and comp computer-aided design, which I do like that term because it's it's a correct open term. You studied at the AA and you did the MTech. Uh, and now you work at Zaha Did as a designer, which was a kind of natural prog progression, I guess, from, the, from AA. And uh, you've kind of... You also work in Zaha Code, right? So you're in the kind of specialist computational or modeling group at Zaha with Sharjah and all that crew, uh, which yeah. is pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. I was just at Shape to Fab, and they were presenting some some interesting stuff. Uh, but of course, you got into this world of AI over the last two years, or or a little bit more than that. Okay. Um... It's tricky because it depends on what you mean by AI, right? There's like the umbrella term AI, and then there is the more recent diffusion model, uh, text to image explosion. So if you're referring to just that, that's actually been less than a year since I started. Uh, from now to go back, I think it's around end of July of 2022 is when I actually yeah. started picking up Midjourney stuff because that's when version three was released. Yeah. And I was seeing a lot of really cool and crazy um, imagery started flooding the Instagram pages. Right. And that's when I took note that this thing exists. And I started to want to explore myself. But if we talk about general AI, I was like to add that prior to, you know, doing 
diffusion AI research. I was, um, for example, in emerging technologies and AA, I did my thesis on evolutionary algorithm, genetic algorithm. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, using uh, optimization parameters for uh, structure and for material systems. And in a way, that's sort of like another version of AI uh, using yeah. machine to uh, basically optimize and find solutions. Um, beyond that, uh, there's also a bit of like machine learning things here and there. And generally what I do with, you know, parametric design, I always try to involve a bit of, you know, machine agency. So like even agent-based system, I've worked on some projects related to that. And that's also another form of AI. So kind of yeah. like the general broad spectrum of AI, I always like to touch here and there. But the most recent one is definitely the one that kind of really stuck to my career path at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that was, <laughs> so yeah, you've always had this interest and that was the, the starting point to this amazing trajectory you've been on over the last uh, year or so, right? Of, uh, I mean, you're, yeah. you're the AI guy at the moment and you've kind of, <laughs> you've also got- Yeah, I never expected that. Didn't plan for it. And I guess that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you've gone on this amazing- growth of showing your work and uh, also sharing how to integrate these tools with your teaching side. We've seen this amazing growth on social media. You've been, you know, lecturing for uh, Harvard, GSD. You've been Milan Design Week. You're about to go to uh, Venice Benali. Uh, and you've also been teaching already with uh, PA Academy, right? And um, mm -hmm. did you do any other ones or? It's mostly uh, well, like I have university modules where I do it from different universities, uh, the one time things. Uh, otherwise, the more regular one is, yeah, with PA Academy, which we do yeah. around every one or two months. Yeah, exciting times, man. Well, thank you for joining. Of course, my first question was like, let's get let's go to the origin stories of, of how you got into the AI, but you've already kind of touched on that. Um, it's it was it's kind of an interesting start because it was really very um integrated with your interest in computation parametric design which is which is super interesting how are those two worlds kind of combining now like with with your let's talk about your own design process right i think mm -hmm. i've seen you kind of going from images and then you kind of try and create uh recreate the the building or whatever it is in uh rhino and grasshopper have you found the two worlds are still, because the way I'm using music is still quite separate. How do you find that the two worlds are, are conjoining at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you said, it's kind of separate at the moment. Um, it's just the way, you know, the fusion model is completely image oriented. It's pixel based. So fundamentally, the, the output is two dimension. And um, from there, it takes the human intuition and specialized skill sets to kind of rationalize and understand the space and then try to produce it in 3D. So right now, the sort of the nonlinear way is just to have the human bit in the middle to try to rationalize and interpret it yourself. But I always like to talk about the prospective future of where this will no longer be the case. And I think we are approaching towards that technology. So I'm literally like kind of constantly waiting for the next update of the on the 3d front of the ai development yeah because the 2d ones have been just exploding right from yeah. last year less than a year ago to now i mean i'm seeing going from mid journey version 3 that very rough texture all the way to absolute photorealism that we have today yeah and right. that like less than a year progress can potentially happen with the other fronts too um we are starting to see you know the large language models having a huge explosion in technological advancement. And so I think the natural next step would be for these um, technologists, these developers to then really link that machine learning and the, the generative AI towards 3D modeling directly. I know people will mention that there are already you know, starting points. There are some very like rough versions of that, but I haven't seen anything that's substantial enough for us to actually utilize it for advanced level designing. So I'm expecting that to happen at some point. And then I'm expecting also it's going to be linked to BIM modeling, potentially. Yeah. It's going to be linked to just production of 2D plans, sections, elevations, construction drawings. I really feel like it's all within the capabilities of the technology. And we are approaching towards that. 
So I think there's a lot of huge developments that is bottlenecking and we are just waiting for it. And the time that we're standing today is kind of like really short. What yeah. we're standing here is a kind of like historical moment right before the revolution really takes off. So we're only getting like the, the beginning taste of it. Yeah, it's it's crazy times I feel that we're in where, I mean, I keep saying it's really exciting, but also very scary at the same time. <laughs> it is, it is. You actually have to talk about like what type of industry is replacing, how everybody has to adapt. And the fact that you, you do have to adapt because technology has never really been forgiving for people that don't innovate. Yeah. So... You know, I always think of back when there were architecture professors and architects that were against like CAD softwares, yeah. um, how much they survived post CAD, you know, it's uh, definitely going to be, if not more so cataclysmic than that's revolution. That's a great point, because I think, uh, you know, I've battled since I've been at uni of, of like adopting more things like even something as simple as Revit, which we all know, like the BIM era, mm -hmm. right, is mm -hmm. we're still talking, firms are still debating whether they should adopt. Yeah, it's BIM funny. They're so slow. Not. Like you're yeah. adapting to BIM modeling. I'm still trying to push Grasshopper more, for example, yeah. algorithmic yeah. modeling, parametric modeling. Even that's still a front that uh, is still kind of it's like slow in the middle of adaptation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, we've been, you know, slow to adopt these tools, which compared to AI are moving at a snail's pace, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and AI is just like the bullet train. It didn't by. wait for us. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, you know, if you're not adopting it, it it's it's going to be a, an issue. Um, and we're really just scratching the surface, right? It's like all this image generation stuff is kind of like the the bit of the iceberg you can you can kind of see. I mean, we're yes. still seeing people get into uh, the machine learning size. Like once you start to train a model to be specifically an architect, you start to give it BIM models and 3D models as data sets to learn from. Um, it's going to be it's going to be quite amazing. Like the, these image generation tools are not honed to be an architect, but they're already able to produce like uh, really compelling, compelling stuff. Um, which yeah. is yeah, exciting and, and crazy. Maybe I think what's, what's really interesting to touch on at the moment is in your own design process, how does it fit into your own architectural process of design? Right? Like, um, I mean, I, I've been tinkering with it on the side. I think it's, uh, for me, it's a super interesting way to visualize ideas really quickly. Um, a really dumb way to ascribe it, describe it to some people is like a super Pinterest, right? They can, <laughs> they can create ideas, but it's, it's mm -hmm. much more than that as well, right? It's, it's now we're starting to see, I think you had some great examples where you're actually sketching, then generating and so you're you're kind of able to give it a bit that direction uh, but talk us a little bit about how how is your workflow now and, and do you connect it with <laughs> other architecture tools like rhino grasshopper or even even mention revit but i assume that's <laughs> that's probably further out <laughs> yeah with the adaptation to 3d modeling that's my only answer is that it's, it's just manual at the moment yeah. until the better technology comes along but in the terms of uh, general ideation in the conceptualization, the initial phases, it's incredibly powerful. And for me, I think I've been kind of making myself very flexible to explore on different fronts. There is the technological side of how to uh, adapt to better methodologies for prompt crafting to get what you want. So in terms of um, part of what I try to do is regain control. So it's kind of like extremely chaotic if you start. Uh, so these generative tools are just producing out of vast amounts of results. And yeah. instead of quantity, it's kind of like the human focus is on quality. So yes, we're guaranteed infinite quantities. So now it's like, how do we uh, manage to control it? So methodologies that I developed that I teach at PA, for example, are certain things that I, I utilize specifically in my strategies to design what I look for 
And when I look for in design, I, I be very, very specific. Um, and also with, uh, like you said, sketch to render, that's also another technology that I've uh, developed to basically, well, not develop, I didn't develop it, but I kind of managed to find a way to better, you know, synthesize my concepts more directly to produce yeah. the results that mid journey can then also interpret and give a little bit of an AI flair because it does in fact quite change a lot in my sketch as well. But sometimes for the better, because then you start optioneering and you start to see what your sketches can be. And then the real buildings that it can generate from those sketches. And very quickly, even once you have the final result, you can still just generate more results to see, okay, now I want to change it even more, what that's like. So that contributes a lot to the design process because we are now uh, in abundance of options. Uh, yeah. Yeah kind of like a super powerful office where you're the captain and you're hiring hundreds of interns to do <laughs> tons of sketches for you and accept that they do it in like 10 seconds, five seconds. Yeah. And you are empowered to control what you want from that. So I do see that as an extremely practical use on a concept level. And I am still exploring how to use it for other cases as well. So I think it's kind of like a deep ocean of possibilities that me included and all the, I guess, the, the top AI people exploring this as well on social media. I think we're all scratching the surface because there's just too much possibilities. And I think everybody else, I'm, I like to encourage everyone else to just do your own research as well, because the case uses the potential is quite infinite yeah and yeah. it's too new yeah yeah no i think um there's a couple of points i like, like that are really good to touch on there i think it's it's one you, you're saying is like uh control and i think mm. having been down a few weekends rabbit holes of just uh going at, like i have an idea and of course as an architect you you sort of ha i can visualize that ideal and, and sketch it mm. and then i was like well let's try and do this with mid journey and and like uh kind of push it in that direction and sometimes you can get really kind of close to the idea but also it's frustrating you, you're you're never quite on the, your own idea right it's like you're kind of on this journey with this <laughs> this mid journey uh, designer um, and I always describe it as kind of like a pet rhino it's incredibly powerful and you can maybe mm -hmm. kind of get it to walk down the street with you but it just it would just like will kind of smash through the corner or something so I yeah, think I almost see it as a part of our brain in a way because you're giving it prompt but its results also informing you so exactly. I do see it more so like an extension of our uh, intelligence human intelligence uh, you know, traditionally, we like to just separate the two machine or human. But I think I'm hoping that there's a future where we have a, a co-creation machine human intelligence as a collective. Yeah, I think that's um, that's exactly it. in uh, the Petra Kuta that we just gave. I, I had one side where I kind of, you know, t completely robbing it from the life 3.0 uh, analogy that we've we were in the kind of architect 1.0 where we're very analog drawing detailing mm -hmm. then we're in the architect 2.0 which was the computer aided era where we had tools like grasshopper and computation where we're kind of mm -hmm. using uh our computer just as like a almost like a mule just to either run a script really quickly automate the things that we do and maybe flirt with what people think is ai of generative design where you're just iterating through millions of options but now i think we're, we're entering into this architect 3.0 which will be ai collaborative like you're collaborating with ai to design or to produce and I think you're, you're also your analogy of, of like you now have tons of interns. Well, if you have tons of interns, you wouldn't really call them a tool. It's I, I don't know if you could call AI at this point a, a tool. Some, at some point it is and some point it isn't, but it's really a collaborator. Like interns and the people you work with, you collaborate together to, to you know come up with these ideas. And I feel like AI, even at this point with the image generation stuff, it does feel very collaborative. Like you say, it's you're giving it inputs it's then inspiring you and oh yeah let's go down this road and and explore things so do you do you feel like would you classify ai as a 
has it transcended or crossed that line of yeah so, I mean, that's why i use the analogy mind. of the of the extension of your brain right because i do see it as an extension of our intelligence as opposed to an extension of our hands for example that would be quite different uh it is also a tool it is both i would say right because of course it's powering us to do what we want to do but it has a bit of that autonomy right now as well and that's what then transcends itself from being just a tool to being a separate extension of your intellect but as a tool as well so i guess you could categorize as both i think that should be a category as well um yeah i mean it's informing us right it's informing the designer so that's where it fundamentally changes from the traditional softwares the software it has an ability to really um change your perception of design and i think it will eventually reshape the way we think about architectural design as well a bit is a bit right now on the formalist um just visual based but hopefully right. that will transition yeah i think the visual basis is an an interesting point in that like it's so hard to kind of feel how how this is going to affect us as architects it already is right mm. especially as we've become more and more image creators right mm. we we don't we've you know from the days of the master builder right where the architect was designing building you know there's engineering everything in one one place we've over the years become image creators we we create that vision and what does it yeah, mean for us now Instagram that, for that as well <laughs> uh, say that again i i blame social media and instagram i think right. they have to contribute to also the discourse of design and that's also another big topic to hatch because with ai it's kind of riding the high tide of um instagram and the social media yeah. representing yeah. architecture and design as visual snippets if you will mm -hmm. so it doesn't fundamentally touch upon what you know the the broader values of architecture, designing form and light and spaces, function, circulation, um, usage, occupancy, and engineering, things that are a bit under the hood. But those are very crucial for what we consider in the industry. Uh, and that's how we try to work towards the second half of the design in order to realize and to actually make good places, placemaking. Yeah. So <laughs> kind of like Instagram is giving us the most facadistic version of architecture as well and i think ai is then riding on top of that wave right now by just being 2d visual producers so i think we do have a caveat going on we have to start addressing that as well and be careful that this is only the visual aspect whereas architecture is a discipline there's a broader spectrum that we do have to talk about and analyze no i, I think that it, that is true but I, you know we've been we've been becoming image uh, creators for you know way before social media right like if you hire an architect um you know and and they design something it's it's like looks amazing you ask mm. how much does it cost you don't really know how is it going to stand up an architect mm. wouldn't really know how to build it you know you you don't necessarily know these things of course as an architect you design the space there's there's technical aspects to it but you for a long time, the weight was really that the architect was the the image creator, like the vision creator, right? And of course, there was lots that went behind that image, uh, lots of thinking, of working out spaces. Mm -hmm. But now, anyone can create that image. So, you know, on one hand, does it will it make architects? And we could pick, for example, like a, a star architect like Frank Gehry, right? That's um, quite a style driven architect right would that make a frank Gehry more valuable because uh they are the original authors of the their style their, there's it's much more than just image there's a thinking behind it or does that devalue them because now anyone can type in the words and create something that may look like it's designed by the original uh frank Gehry? yeah there's some good points there um but i like to address the fact that like the creation, the, the ability to create images, even for traditional architects, is not what gives them intrinsic value as architects. Like, I completely agree with you that, yeah, the architects and the artists, if you will, even, that they produce the best imagery and they will in 
employ their own both technical skill sets as well as visual acumen and things that are more kind of like intrinsically talented. And so all these things are a bundle of things that altogether produces the the, the value. Yeah. Um, with Frank Gehry, obviously, um, just being able to replicate his style and not resolve the geometry and architecture for functionality and it just beauty at every corner is is also going to be uh, would not be the same as valuing Frank Gehry uh, architecture. Uh, so I think if I were to address, um, what I was saying earlier, perhaps it's not that we are, um, becoming more image generators, but I like to say this more so that social media platform has made the consumption of architecture more visual oriented. So not for us as a role of, of, you know, architects, but as society in general, Back in the days, if you know you build a coliseum, it's for the experience, it's for function. It's the only way that people actually experience the architecture in its true intrinsic value. Nowadays, every single architecture are already famous on Instagram as an image before anyone goes yeah. and visit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And by the time yeah. they visit it, they'll yeah. take that same Instagram photo to prove that they're there. And that's how they consume architecture and how they share their consumption of that architecture. So I think there is a underlying narrative, a shift in the way we consume architecture. And that caveat, I think, is something to be addressed now with these tools like AI being also visually oriented. And it's going to just kind of like viciously cycle into that direction without, um, you know, addressing the more visual spatial aspects. And that's why I, I kind of like really support ideas like metaverse and augmented reality, because they mm. actually then re-engage this architecture in an experiential, phenomenological and 3D spatial way that actually re-examines architecture as a, as a three-dimensional experiential um, uh, commodity as opposed yeah. to just image commodity. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's a super interesting point, and I like that could be that could be quite a mind blowing space to be in and and experience one of just like you know like you say transcending transcending past two D images, um, also like architecture being influenced by that. Like, do you get more architects now designing things that would be more Instagrammy and and liked on Instagram? Yeah, that's okay. exactly the point. Like we're working with like iconic firms and all our buildings are meant to be iconic buildings, right? Yeah. Um, that applies to your office as well. That applies to all these big uh, Star Architect offices. We always yeah. have this incentive to to design for that image as well. So that, that has a definite place in our goal. But transcending to the metaverse would be a super interesting way to to bring that back. Um, and yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen a couple, like, um, I think it was with Stable Diffusion, people did like a VR experience where it was actually like generating as you're moving around, which would be, really? which would be pretty nuts. I mean, it was, a, I think it was a, it was a good few months ago now, but it was like, uh, almost like trippy as you look around, it would then change to something oh, else. Oh, does it hallucinate and change yeah. as it goes? Oh uh, yeah. The, that's right now the technology. I mean, I've seen this things also way back when, you know, Google was a dream AI. Do you remember like way back when you have just uh, videos and then they put just everything looks like dogs and yeah, little yeah. things that hallucinates the like, very early phases of AI. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of 3D, have you seen, I mean, just to touch on your point, so you were talking about 3D, like I guess you were talking text to 3D, text to BIM is coming. Is there any kind of interesting examples that people listening can look up? Um, off the top of my head, I could the only text to BIM thing I've really I've kind of seen is Hyper. Um, um, mm. Andrew at Hyper was playing around with with text to BIM. I've seen some text to three D, but it was very primitive. It was like forming a mesh of a dog or a cat or something like that. But is there any, anything? Yeah, that, I saw that one. Yeah. No, I think right now it's just like not worth telling the mass audience to to really explore that deeply yet because yeah. it's like telling people to explore uh you know google dream when we're waiting for mid journey v3 um because when v3 comes you know everything has to be completely scratched and then research is redone because it's our new frontier you don't ever want to go back 
So I would say the best thing is to just wait until that technology passes its initial nascent stage and actually becomes viable as a tool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I've seen some interesting examples. I do wonder how text to 3D I could see being fairly rapid. Text to something technical like a BIM model. Uh, Mm. I'm curious how long that would take because in theory you'd have to give it a lot of models to learn from or plans to learn from and all those things maybe there's enough online that that um you know you yeah. can access enough but the, the soul of the technology is the is the database right yeah that's really like what you touched on um and i don't know how many offices are willing to open source our yeah, information <laughs> it gets tricky right because in the bim world is is like well who owns the bim model because sort of you know the architecture firm owns it the the client owns it it's all mm. in different formats in you know even down to naming conventions of things and the way mm. people model the, certain things i do wonder because we've been slow to adopt bim maybe it would actually slow down the development of like like a technical uh bim ai architect kind of thing um but yeah, so I, I do wonder how long we get there till we get to that technical stage. Is that something that's, that's just going to fly through or is, is it going to take some time just because we've been slow you know, to adopt technology? I, I have become more optimistic as the large language models started releasing. Um, you know, I was already pretty optimistic with the diffusion models, but the large language model from what I've seen are exhibiting uh, signs of general intelligence and being able to solve certain things and have an understanding of physics and and the real world instead of just hallucinating language solutions it's it's becoming a bit like a brain that actually understands and has a map of the world without explicitly having it and you know it's such a black box obviously there's experts that are way more um uh has way more expertise to talk about the subject but i think they also generally have this uh, understanding that it's becoming smarter than we can understand it and so because of that and how fast it's developing i think now it's really on a trajectory where if you get a large language model that understands um and can map out space and physics then it would be able to solve it without a database but through uh, understanding solutions intrinsically so you you give it that mid journey you know end result uh, as an image, and then you tell them this is the amount of square footage we need, this is the amount of occupancy, and this is uh, the material that we're going to use, and these are the construction costs, and it might be able to solve it step by step, just because if you break down a step by step, a lot of these tasks I think ChatGPT four can already yeah. accomplish, which yeah. is insane. Yeah. I, I've been using it for solving certain things and speeding up my process yeah. both in architecture in scripting in just uh, saying like generate some uh, mathematical equations to better produce this um, catenary curve uh, for structural optimization to giving me um, certain solutions if the client needs this if the client wants that i've been asking ChatGPT to try to see how much of that task it can replace and i'm starting to realize it's becoming more and more so I'm very optimistic at where this technology goes. Yeah. Talk to us about like, uh, so your role at, at Zaha right now, you're, you're a designer, but you're also in Zaha code. Um, yeah. How are you working with AI in terms of like, is that your main focus or are you also working on computational stuff? Like, uh, you know, I mean like day-to-day computational mm. stuff, helping out teams and all that kind of stuff. Or are you solely focused on AI within Zaha? Uh, so yeah contrary to what everybody expects i'm actually mostly not working on ai um right. i do contribute with some uh, studies and papers here and there much like um it's mostly self-organized um research efforts throughout the office yeah. but uh from what i can say um you know uh everybody's exploring it you know every office is exploring it. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you guys uh, obviously have a lot of uh, interest as well um, but in terms of, um, you know, I think Patrick has already disclosed that we've been using it for a certain concept level generation to, yeah. to understand how we can adapt the initial concept phase. And I think 
just because that's the capabilities of, of um, like Midjourney and Dali too, then that's what we're using it for at the moment, partially. But uh, personal to me, I mean, my specialization is still like uh, parametricization of facades, facade yeah. systems. I've been doing that for about like two years at the office now where I am specializing in the almost like the detailed design phase where, um, you know, sub- solutions are presented to me in terms of the design, but then I have to uh, design it, uh, rationalize it, um, rationalize the geometry, find modular patterns, and then deploy it and allow uh, feasibility to it to become more feasible and economical. So that's actually my, <laughs> more so my specialization. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also seeing uh, working with construction uh, teams uh, to see that project actually being built. So it's funny. Right now, in my career, I'm kind of up on the second half of the architectural design phase, yeah. uh, more so than concept. But that's why I also um, enjoy a lot experiencing, um, experimenting in my own time, yeah. kind of uh, my capabilities as a designer in the concept phase with AI. Yeah, I think that's interesting. We've we've got somewhat similar paths in that uh, I also, you know, I was also a designer. Was like uh, super interested in using computation parametrics. I went down the road of, you know, the more you get into it, the more you end up at facades because that's where mm-hmm. a lot of this is used. Then I went down the road mm-hmm. of working for Front, where we were actually working with uh, Zaha to build a Morpheus Hotel and and uh, mm-hmm. doing all the BIM models of, of that. And I think I had a similar thing, right? That was kind of my my day job, but I also had this design itch and that's where I started to kind of experiment with, with my own projects and, and things like that. So that's really interesting that you're kind of, you know, and I think it's really good because you have this utilization of BIM and computation on a technical level, like actually building stuff, but then you're also playing at the concept. And I always mm. say to young architects if you fuse those two worlds like you understand how things are built and the restrictions like you can't just make a panel that's like endlessly big because you, you need to find a truck to put it on and things like that mm. <laughs> yeah that's a really good point i think the the essence of what i'm always trying to do is really be in the middle of the two right yeah. the tech world i've always been pursuing a higher education related to advanced computation and design but at the same time it's design I've always made sure that I'm within the territory of design and creation. And so when programs like Midjourney came up, I realized that I had the capabilities of um, the producing methodologies and solving problems uh, arithmetically, but also uh, I have an artistic side that now can flourish because this tool is so readily available. And that's right. I think this combination of the two is what gave me the ability to really produce the, the type of research that I was doing and also showcase it to the world. So I really have to contribute to the fact that I really stayed on the path of the two. I didn't have to go too into tech uh, or too into design. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think it's, it's still a really hard th- thing to find people that have the design side, but also the, the technology side. And, that's why I always say to young architects, like, you know, get into Grasshopper and things like that. And just, mm-hmm. that's a it's a great way to get started. And now to yeah, get yeah, started. You can with- help each other. If you get into Grasshopper, it also opens a new avenue to how you design and yeah. think about design. And, it's, and you- the thinking is, is what's interesting, right? The computational thinking. Yeah. And uh, it's very different to your traditional, what you're traditionally taught at, at uni, maybe of design architecture thinking. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously we're, we're pretty pro, uh, tech and AI and stuff, but (laughs) we have to say, like, we have to have a discussion of, you know, do you see the, uh, like some, some real red flags and warnings of, for example, people are saying, should, should AI just go on a, on hold for six months? And, um, obviously this is going to disrupt our industry more than people may think right now. You know, I'm sure people are like, oh yeah, they're just, you know, this thing can create images and stuff like that. Um, do you see, you know, do you have concerns or, or thoughts on the cons of, of AI right now? Yeah, you're touching on a very, uh, pertinent subject. So I think disruptive, definitely. Yes. But I don't think that's why people want to do the pause for six months because it's more so fundamentally like general artificial intelligence can potentially 
is the point of um, singularity where mm -hmm. we for, we cannot understand the black box and this black box becomes smarter than us and is able to produce more black boxes and it will spin out of control and we will reach that point of exponential growth because mm -hmm. a smarter AI will produce even smarter AIs. So I do understand the sort of the existential um, fear that we have about general AI development. But specific to design, I think our industry is where we can show the prowess of AI, the positive that it can do to humanity. So I think while other you know fields and industries can potentially see AI as dangerous, especially like you know national defense and military, uh, you know, I, I really don't want them to go into too much AI <laughs> development or autonomy with that. Uh, but with regards to design, I don't see too much negative size that it can spin out of control. I just see that it can automate a lot of process. It will generate a lot of new designs, given that we're still in control of the overall process. And that's where I argue that us as architects, that we always have to be in control of that process because there's a human level of ethic, design ethos, and a hierarchy of needs that we need. So therefore, we cannot just automate the task of the architect. We can automate the task of the production. So right. for us, I think it's our incentive to showcase to the world how AI can be a net positive benefit. And what I try to showcase is world building, um, architecture, interiors, product, seeing how AI can produce beauty with human intervention and why we should see the positive light of it despite the fears. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. I think the last point of like, uh, you know, it's it's kind of open up new ideas, it creates new solutions uh, to essentially make make our world a better place. Uh, mm. I guess that is it could be a perceived as a positive or a negative, but in theory, we could see the production side is another massive area where it could be. Uh, hugely implemented. I always joke about like AI could be as boring as a Mr. Clippy for Revit that tells you like your your stairs are not code compliant and stuff like that, right? <laughs> All of these mm. things could be vastly automated um, so that we can spend more time, you know, making impact where it, where it matters the most. But that in theory, that would also mean that potentially there's less, you know, more architects are, would be, get put out of a job because all these things are, are uh, are being automated or replaced by AI, which you know could be perceived as a positive because in theory maybe we'll see smaller groups of architects can do larger projects and thus we can get better paid as architects because that that is a problem. Of course, negative side is maybe overall there'll be less architects working in practice potentially. Yeah, and the ones that are in practice will probably be the better ones, <laughs> as always. <right? laughs> it's a natural yes. selection of, of AI. Natural selection. I mean, I don't feel sympathy towards being replaced by technology. Like, you could ask, would you feel sympathy for the horse breeders when before cars were invented? Would yeah, you feel yeah. sympathy for portrait painters before photography was invented to replace the vast majority of their jobs? They still exist as a small minority and they don't earn the same wage as before, but as a whole humanity has improved because the technology that has been introduced. So I think the narrative where technology is replacing part of our jobs, that's always going to be the case. And I'm always for it because what essentially we end up doing in humanity is we transition our task to better suit the technology because it has already replaced us in the menial task and things that can be done by machines. So I would say there's absolutely no problem. We have to admit that it will be disruptive to the industry. And yes, job will be lost. A lot of people's job will be lost and they will be forced to change what they do. But that's just the broader spectrum of human development. We always have done so where technology replaced us and we changed. And I don't see any reason that's going to stop. So it's not a con. It's just a fact of human a, progress. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only thing that's concerning is possibly the speed of this particular technology. That's the thing that could be, you know, like these other technologies have slowly started to, to displace architects, but we could see AI displace 
at a very fast rate. I, I'm not sure, but that that could be the challenge, maybe. Um, but you it's know, a hit. Not something for us. It's difficult to stop. Like, <laughs> no, I don't think there should be efforts to stop it. It's kind of like saying. What about we slow down the development of mass-produced cameras because we still have professional photographers only or portrait yeah. painters. Uh, we should slow down the progress of cameras because if everybody get a camera, we're going to lose the art of it. And everyone's just going to produce cheap photos. Uh, what, how the world will be, you know? What about all those photographers and their jobs? I mean, like, you know, these, these can be, there's parallels all throughout history. Uh, I just think uh, there isn't much point to slow it down. I we guarantee. will have to... I, I guarantee you yeah. we'll see a rise of artisanal architects with like beards like this and <laughs> <laughs> all in between. No yeah. computers in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the hipsters, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a hipster lion version. Because it, yeah, it all yeah. comes back, right? It was like uh now you 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 like uh you know, I'm, i live in Shoreditch and down the road there's like a artisanal bread maker and they make the bread classically and it's like super popular. We'll see the same thing in architecture for sure. I mark my words now. They'll all, they'll have little tattoos no, right. of like uh, protractors and uh, <laughs> scale room. Oh god! I'm almost doing a T square, for example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's maybe a, a couple more points to touch on. Is like um, I, I've been teaching at IAC this year, and um, it's a, a in a master's studio, and of course, I was like use chat gpt use mid journey as much as you can don't hide it tell me tell us because we want to you know we want to encourage you you to use it like uh and and architecture education is another thing that's been kind of very slow that's one of the reasons we started architect network was to do courses and things where people could learn these stuff but you mm. know i feel we we have to start to integrate these into into uh architecture education now as well because it's it's mm -hmm. another component to this absolutely you can't stop uh learning new technologies especially in architecture and they are slow they're always going to be slower but yeah. there's theories that we do have to learn you know just to have the the backdrop of the architecture or history theory and understanding of the greater value and then once you have that you have to start to understand how to deploy the new technologies in order to achieve those architectural values Absolutely important. Yeah. yeah. One other point I wanted to to touch on because I think you've experienced this amazing growth on Instagram, right? Um, <laughs> so you've now passed. I I didn't actually check today, but you you passed a hundred thousand a few weeks ago. I seem to remember, or maybe it was a month month ago. Time to time flies by. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's crazy. Talk it's talk crazy. about that journey because I think it's. Uh, I'm always super interested in like you know, these moments where you've, it, you know, to use the term viral or whatever, you've, you've kind of exploded on social media. And of course there's a component of um, like this image generation is, is almost like an influencer's best friend that now you can produce content at, at a crazy amount of time. Um, talk to us about your, your, the social media side of it was, is it just a result of you posting this and, and you kind of, I'm, I saw that you made a post about riding waves of social media and this kind of thing. Was this just a result of you posting things and, and it just blew up or did you have any kind of like strategy or, uh, you know, thought behind the, the social media side? Cause I think that's a really interesting component as well. Absolutely. Um, July of 2022, I had about a few hundred followers and wow. ever since then, I had just, you know, it's not even been a year, yeah. but I had steady progress. It wasn't a overnight sensation yeah. type of thing. You know, I actually generally understood what thing, what type of things go viral and I started to study it. Uh, honestly, at this point, I feel like at some point I won't even publish a book about it because there's so much stuff to unpack here. Yeah. Um, you touched on a really important point, but it's a, it's an art form in itself to understand uh, the psychology of virality, you know, understanding how to achieve um, image design. And that's the artistic component involved. There's a psychological component involved. There's also understanding societal engagement and what type of things resonates with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's on a broader spectrum, kind of like an 
artistic um, engagement. It is an artistic um, pursuit to see what type of things will engage with society, will resonate with people, and what society is looking for, what is needed. And every stage I've transitioned, I, I didn't uh, just do it one thing or the other. Yeah. Um, it's basically like every stage I had to adjust. So things, when it slows down, I plateau. I understand this tech, this tra trajectory no longer works. I have to switch it up. So my uh, all my strategies constantly switch. At the beginning, I wanted to just showcase. Uh, okay, let's just start at the beginning. Basically, I started seeing a lot of AI generation, and they're all a bit chaotic, right? I realized what is lacking is uh, someone who is trying to produce realistic architecture that was extremely rational, but beautiful and aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, amongst this chaos, this ocean of crazy AI things. So I started to stand out right at the beginning because I was the one that was doing very well-controlled, slow stuff right. with very foggy and calm background. And that was intentionally and specific for me in order to stand out, to have a sort of repeatable style that people will know. If you follow this guy, um, you're going to see the industry side, the realistic side of someone trying to apply it for feasible design. Yeah. And that's going to stand out in the ocean of chaos. And then after that, I started to transition into teaching. A lot of what I do is try to showcase methodologies of what I use and also showcase how uh, different types of AI uh, behave differently, the different versions. So there's a showcase element uh, as well. So that's also kind of started to get uh, some traction as well, the pedagogical nature of what I showcase. And on top of that, I mean, there's so many things. There's also that um, a post I did in support of uh, uh, Iranian women's struggle, you know, the, during that time when um, there was that uh, Masa Amini uh, situation yeah. happening there. Yeah. So basically, that's the kind of, I guess, the more the artistic side of me trying to um, engage with the public as a uh, uh, an artist in a sense more so than a technologist where i try to showcase you know very human values and, and very uh, human ethos and that type of stuff really also it resonates with a lot of people yeah and yeah. so these are all steady milestones of which helped me establish where i am today and uh that's also including teaching at pa um doing conferences and talks all these things are accumulative now, in terms of what I do with um, posting the images, I have a lot of strategies. Um, I have actually an Excel spreadsheet back in the days where every image that I did post, I put the views on the side. I'm like, okay, this image had this many views and this many likes. Was it successful? Was it not? And then I started writing down, why was this one successful? Why was it not successful? And I did that for almost for every post up until a certain point. Yeah. So I was very methodical to try to understand how to do the next image creation. I became like a bit obsessed over um, trying to be viral at the beginning phase. And after I went over, you know, 40, 50 K, I just like completely um, stopped thinking it that way and just started to think, what can I contribute in the discourse of knowledge with this whole AI boom? So it has carried me to this day. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a second uh, podcast on uh, social media. But that, I think that's why I was really interested to ask you because I, you know, from the outside, you see these things and it's just like, wow, you know, you just post every now and again and, and, you ride this wave of, of AI at the, at the right time and the right place. But it, as you explained, it was much more um, like thought through and, and calculated, which is really interesting. I think, um, you know, as architects, there's loads of young architects that can learn from that and understand it. I can definitely learn from it because I think we're, again, we're, we're slow at adopting these things and you see more individuals, but still less practices kind of uh, adopting it well, you know, that they usually like have a big account because they, they, quite established and have big names but i think there's a lot young architects can can learn from that so you should do a course on uh pa on uh on the social media side as well <laughs> that cool. would be quite an interesting one to tackle yeah <laughs> do, you, do you ever then is there ever then like a battle of of do you start create like does it influence the design a little bit because you you're kind of you're trying to marry these two worlds right you you're pursuing an idea that I don't know, it could be something really architectural, but you're also kind of uh, 
crafting this for a crowd, uh, a specific audience. So, mm, that's interesting. Or is it? Or is it like you have a project, an idea, mm. and there's like your architectural production, uh, and then there's your social media production of the same project. Um, yeah, that's hard even to answer. I think it's a bit of both, right? Because I think. Fundamentally, we're all utopian as architects. We all imagine that we have like the best idea concept in our head. And then it's just how we actually manifest it is the challenge. So with using my journey, I think it's always inferior to what I have in my head, but I can always try to get as close as possible. Um, and then there's that side of what engages with the public and I think there's an overlap because what I think if I have very good design in my in my concept that I want to showcase to the world, then that will be viral. That will be a hit. People will resonate with it. So I don't actually have to cater towards, you know, a certain crowd or narrative. Yeah. But that being said, I, there, I think there's a degree of also trying to target certain narratives in um, my design that also will, I believe, will be a hit. For example, the one I did with um, uh, Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night as a bedroom interior. Yeah. I know that that's such a widely recognized, beautiful image, absolutely spectacular. And I just had this concept, you know, if that was an interior bedroom with like nightlight ambience and a bit of fluid architecture, how, how cool that would be. So... That's actually a gray area, right? Did I yeah. did I like envision that out of the blue, or was that something that I'm catering towards the public? I guess it's kind of it's a bit, always a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a bit of both, but it's 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 in a good way, you know. Um, but no, that's super interesting. For the architects out there listening to this, or the young architects, like, what would your advice to you know to completely fresh of this and and maybe a little bit scared of this AI stuff? How would you advise to to get started? Uh, well, definitely not be scared. I think uh, it's just technology. Um, don't get scared. There's nothing to be scared of. Um, but approach your research in a methodical way. Uh, that's where all the merit comes to. When you empirically understand certain behaviors, you map it out. You gain better control. Like the way I try to develop my methodologies is through varying one parameter at a time so that I know the actual implications of my actions. And thus, I'm able to produce so much um, complex uh, behaviors that I document and, and then I teach with it. So I would say approach it with a very researcher-oriented mathematical mindset because it is a technology in the end. It is an algorithm and it has repeatable rules that you can um, repeat as a uh, as an outcome, um, and then be excited as well because with the advent of new technology in the sector of architecture, we are experiencing another gold mine of opportunities. Uh, I wouldn't have made it to where I am if um, I wasn't extremely curious and inquisitive of new technologies. And I have been throughout my whole life going from algorithmic design to, um, you know, parametricism to agent based genetic algorithm and today to AI. And I'm constantly shifting as well. If something else pops up in the future that I think I'm super interested in, I will also interrogate that technology. So I think it's that having the open researcher mindset to just constantly adapt towards new things and see where what you can do out of it as architects. The tech in architect, you know, understand the technology and do the best you can with it. And that's the spirit, I think, of what um, a great architect should be. So just don't be afraid. Go out there. Make sure you explore the extent of these new technologies. And there is a lot of things unexplored. AI is a vast ocean. And that's why I would say if you are early adapter now, if you go start even today, you will be an early adapter. And it's going to fundamentally reshape the way we think about design in the future. So better be ahead than behind. Yeah. And you, yeah, that's interesting. Like the ship hasn't sailed. We're, we're just getting going. So jump in whilst the water's still, still, still warm. 
Uh, one mm-hmm. one more point just to add on to that was like um, we didn't even talk about prompts, but did you take a, a like a very methodological me- me- way to the prompt crafting as you did, for example, the social media side? Like, were you create creating like a little table of prompts and then you change this one? Because I was also kind of I'm a, I was I'm still in the chaotic phase where I'm like I'll add this and add this, but um, yeah, were you did you also have the same kind of approach to the prompt side? And and how important is the prompts now that mid journeys become more like uh, accessible and kind of friendly on the prompt side of things? Yeah, I mean, when it's not friendly and when it's friendly, they're both equally important because it's kind of like a fundamental backbone of how all these text to image works. So just to give you an idea, my you know parametric architecture course spans two days, mm-hmm. and half of day one. And a quarter of day two is completely about prompt crafting and also multi, also multimodal image prompting as well. So they're pretty essential. And I have, you know, PDFs that I do give out in the course, uh, because there's so many things to address. Uh, there are different matrices of behaviors that I do share and it will become useful as a cheat sheet, you know, to, to understand different things you can do with it. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like I'm still a a noob on the prompt side. Do you still, I guess, do you still feel like, uh, should we be a bit more open with prompts and and we should be sharing them or as a creative, it's still kind of, that's your secret sauce. Um, honestly, I've been sharing my prompts, like, uh, even to the public, uh, whenever I do a lecture and stuff, I do showcase sometimes extensive walkthrough of an entire project Hmm. To me, it's the process that's more important than the text itself. And also, again, going back to the psychology of virality, I believe that if you're the artist or the architect, you you did the first design and that has exploded. Even if people do go ahead and copy and do tons of stuff, variations of it, it will always be a derivative. The best they can do is take samples from it. You've done it, you know. So when I had the idea to do the hair sculpture in support of, of the struggles in Tehran, that, that was it. I've done it. If anybody else does it, they will be copying it. Yeah. I had the idea of putting Vincent Van Gogh as an interior bedroom, and that has exploded through social media and people have seen it. So if they've seen another narrative and another version of it, they know where it's based off of. Yeah. So it's kind of like a real estate. You kind of have to just be the first one to conceive an idea. Uh, it's more idea oriented than the secret sauce of the prompt, but uh, that's a really, yeah, that's a really good way to project because I think some people are super, you know, they they won't share the prompt because that's the, you know, the secret sauce. But as you say, it's it's the idea. I think it's you're the original author. If people do go on and use it, but you're also helping to share and and like people can learn from your prompt and and the things that you used within it. So I think that's super interesting. Uh, so finally, yeah. where can people go and uh, find you and ask you questions? Or if you've got an upcoming course that you want to promote, feel free to give yourself a, a shout out. Um, yeah, where oh. can people find out more about you? <laughs> of course, with, on Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, you got any upcoming courses? Um, yeah, so with Parametric Architecture, um, PA Academy, uh, I do teach there regularly. So Every one or two months, I will make an announcement of another course. So you can keep your eyes out for that if you're interested in learning about, um, you know, things like prompt crafting and utilizing AI. Otherwise, you can catch me in different um, conferences and panels. I have, I think, even two two panels for AI discussion coming up in, for the Venice Biennale. And I have the AA, uh, sorry, the AI summit that's going to happen in a few days. Probably it's too late before the odds are already watching this. Yeah. Um, but clerk and well, there's something. I mean, probably best to just say, just follow me follow on Instagram. You on Instagram yeah. Everything yeah. is on there. Yeah. I'll, Very simple. T.foo. That's it. I'll put it in the description below so people can, can find it. Super quick. And I'll put, put any course that you have coming up when I publish it. But, uh, Thank you so much for uh, for joining. This has been super interesting. Yeah, we'll definitely do. Thanks for having me, Ali. We'll definitely do another one in the future. We'll jump more into uh, prompts and uh, social media. I feel like we we're, we're just getting into some interesting things at the end there. 
Um, yeah, we should keep talking because, you know, as a young um, kind of also content producers uh, in architecture, uh, we have a lot of uh, roles to fill in terms of um, getting things to the public. Yeah. And as you say, we do lack that in our industry. So I'm always very supportive of this. And I think it's a great way to continue to proliferate some ideas around. Yeah. And if you're in London, well, me and Tim are both in London right now. If you're in London, uh, we're just going to announce our next Pecha Kucha in the pub. And Tim, Tim will be one of the speakers there. And the subject will be on AI architecture. It's going to be on the 28th of June in London in the bar Never Forever. So uh, you can, I'll put it in the link below so you can uh, get ready for tickets that will come uh, in June. So you can uh, come and meet Tim and uh, ask him questions of your own. But again, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for everyone that tuned in. We'll be back next two weeks with another podcast. I think Marianne is going to come and we're going to talk about the metaverse, which we touched on. So we'll follow on from that one. But uh, Tim, thank you once again. And uh, see you guys soon. Thank you.